History is full of amazing stories and memorable people, but we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the man who could have saved the Titanic. So, Phil, have you ever taken a voicemail or a phone message for somebody? I know it's a, a bit dated to, to use voicemail these days with all of the smartphones, but we were old enough, I think, um, to have saved messages for friends or family. Yeah, I'm sure I have. I, I definitely have memories of being a kid at home during the summer when my parents were at work and someone would always call and ask for my mom or something and I would have to you know leave a note that says so and so called and I was terrible at actually asking who it was yeah I I definitely remember stuff like that too I also remember thinking uh, in in as we got into high school and and that that like the phone skills that we had learned or sort of learned at that point would kind of become obsolete as people started using caller ID but anyway that's a tangent well, we were never bougie enough to have caller ID at my <laughs> house. Jeez. I don't know that we did on our house phone, though. We got rid of our, rid of our house phones pretty early, though. Like, once everybody had a cell phone, the house phone went pretty quickly. Yeah, we're always late adopters to technology, so we didn't even have cell phones until we were at least, like, high school age, and even then, it wasn't anything too fancy. Yeah. My parents still have a house phone. <laughs> my parents still use the house phone number, even though we don't actually have the phone. <laughs> yeah. Anyway... How do you think your mom would have responded? I'm sure she wasn't pleased when you forgot to give her messages, but how do you think she would have responded if she found out that your forgetting to record a message ended up in a disaster that killed thousands of people and was one of the greatest naval disasters in history? I mean, I think she'd be a little more upset about the leading to a naval disaster part than even just something simple like call grandma back. Are you sure? Seems like a bigger issue than whatever whatever people happened to be calling my mom about when I was 10. So today's episode, I wanted to talk about a gentleman named Jack Phillips. And Jack Phillips was the senior wireless operator aboard the Titanic. And as we'll discuss and find out, uh, his action or inaction, I should say, may or may not have led to both the mistakes causing the Titanic to sink and also you know, a lack of communication with other vessels that caused them to not respond properly once the Titanic did begin to sink. Um, But before we get into the nitty gritty of his life and experience aboard the ship, I'd I'd just like to do a little bit of background info. I know many people are, you know, familiar on a surface level with the the Titanic disaster, but not many people have a pretty well-rounded knowledge. Yeah, I'm sure the average person's knowledge of the Titanic probably doesn't extend much past the yes, movie. Yes, and we'll we'll I have a couple little tidbits about the movie in here too. But to give you a bit of a background, uh, the RMS Titanic entered into service on April second, nineteen twelve. It was about two years before her maiden and final voyage. It was one of three Olympic class ocean liners that was operated by the White Star Line, which is one of the premier kind of forerunner shipping companies of the day in the North Atlantic. So the other two were the Olympic and the Britannic. Uh, All three were designed to be the largest and most luxurious passenger ships in the world. At their time, they were. Um, The Olympic... Do you know, did they all debut around the same time? Did they come out in different years? They debuted within a, a couple of years of each other. I don't know the exact dates on the Olympic and the Britannic, but they all came out within, I would say, about five years of each other. The Titanic broke more of the records, just being the largest, but I don't know the exact So it was the biggest of the three. Yes. So the Olympic, its sister, had a career spanning 24 years until being retired in 1935. Unfortunately, its other sister, the Britannic, also sank in 1916, two years after the Titanic, after hitting a mine in the Aegean Sea. (laughs) So loyal listeners thus far of... History's B-side will know from last episode, the Aegean Sea 
geography located along the Grecian Peninsula. A little callback there. <laughs> Making but sure you guys are watching multiple episodes or listening to multiple paying episodes. Paying attention, yeah. But that's pretty bad that out of this this class of three ships, two of them didn't last very long. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not great. I did a little bit of, of digging, and while a majority of the White Star Line ships did have long, successful careers, at least for ships of that day, at least 17 of them sank at some point during their tenure. Not all to the disastrous effects of something like the Titanic wreck, but it is kind of surprising when we think of, I guess, how kind of spoiled we are today with the technology and the safety standards and things like that uh, that have been put in place, how shipping and, and cruising today is a bit, is viewed at least as a bit safer. Um, I find it hard to believe. It's amazing that people weren't more hesitant then to get on these ships. I mean, t- even today you have a lot of people who are afraid of just seasick and not wanting to be on a cruise ship for whatever reason, but it seems a lot more dangerous a hundred years ago than it is today. Yeah. And, and it certainly was. I mean, they just had older, less reliable technology. But the other thing we have to remember is that they they were used to that. As much as we are used to, I don't know, however many plane crashes happen every year and we take a calculated risk, a small one, but still a risk. Um, it's not as drastic as this, but if it happened on a regular basis, I think we'd find it a little less odd that people were willing to do it. Although... That is one of the reasons I think why it was a bit of, I mean, it was a bigger deal back then. Um, You know, you don't have people standing at like Royal Caribbean or, you know, Disney cruises docks, like waving their hats, at their, their loved ones as they sail away. Cause they're probably going to see them in like a week. So, and the luxury was worth the risk, you know, it's first class sailing <laughs> right. it's a vacation in and of itself, even though you're crossing the ocean and probably not the most glamorous conditions all the time. Yeah. So I, I, you know, as different as it was, I don't think that they probably, I mean, they obviously didn't have the capacity to compare to today, but I don't know that they felt it was outside their normal experience, but there were things that these companies could do to kind of increase their status. One of which was to attach this, these initials to the beginning of their name, RMS, So earlier I referred to the boat as the RMS Titanic, and those initials stand for Royal Mail Steamer. Um, This was essentially a prefix for seagoing vessels that were carrying mail for the British government. Dating back to 1840, this designation kind of helped. I mean, it it was kind of I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine deal where, you know, these ships that were already going to be heading to other places could carry the British Royal Mail, but in doing that and receiving this designation, they were kind of proving themselves to be of a certain mark of quality, a certain worth, which was important at that time. And and a number of those quality-driven bigger brands like White Star and Canard held many ships with this designation. And they kind of funded themselves too that way, right? Yeah, yeah. So they would also receive a cut from the the government to carry this mail. Yeah, if you were just paying for the voyage just based alone on the vacationers it probably would be a really expensive ticket that no one would bother paying and risk sailing across the ocean just for it but if you're getting government contracts as well then yeah it makes more sense to make that voyage in the first place yeah you get this kind of stamp of approval from the government and also get to charge less for tickets make a little bit of money on the side it's a win-win you know i've heard too and i don't know if this was true at the time or if it's true present day, but I've heard that at one point, a lot of these cruise liners were actually also adapted to be military vessels if necessary. Many of them Yeah, you could convert them if whatever country the ship belonged to, if their Navy was in severe need in some kind of naval battle, that the cruise liners themselves could be converted to be used as naval ships. Yeah, and and if nothing else, they can be used to transport troops, but... Uh, earlier, I mentioned that over 17 or, or at least 17 of the White Star Line ships had sunk. Many of those sunk during World War One and World War Two. I don't know for a fact if they were just happened upon a submarine while they were crossing the ocean or were involved in the war, but many of them did meet their fates because of those world wars. That's pretty unfortunate to be <laughs> on vacation and suddenly you're in the middle of World War One. Well, I mean, I think it's kind of on you if you're... <laughs> 
if you're heading over on a cruise to to uh, they're trying to get away they're leaving europe well, at this point fair. or at least this direction yeah i mean of course, if we're you're a couple fleeing, years before that. that's another story but if you're just cruising around the english channel on a ship nope <laughs> so as i mentioned the titanic along with its sisters set a number of records for for size and and grandeur the Titanic was almost one and a half times the gross register tonnage, which is essentially the volume of the ship of the Cunard lines, RMS Lusitania and Mauritania. Um, and as I mentioned, Cunard was kind of a competitor of White Star Line, and they were also the previous record holders of that gross register tonnage record. The Titanic was also nearly 100 feet longer than those ships. Uh, she could carry 3,547 people, and as I said, was built on an unprecedented scale in terms of luxury and size. Her engines were the largest ever built, standing about 40 feet high with cylinders nine feet in diameter. Just for you know, comparison's sake, to give you a visual, a standard tractor trailer is about 45 to 50 feet. So these were almost as, as high as a tractor trailer, a semi-trailer is mm -hmm. long, and about a foot wider, these cylinders were. So with all the size records of the Titanic alone, do you, could that have contributed to its inevitable demise? Just the fact that they've never accounted for a ship this large carrying this many people, does that have any reason to make it more liable to sinking or wrecking anywhere on its voyage? You know, I don't know if engineering-wise these, these reaches had something to do with her sinking or being more vulnerable to it. I venture to guess the answer is yes, but I think what's more likely is that the, I don't know, the ego and lack of caution that came with being the biggest ship, you know, she was seen as the unsinkable ship and they didn't even have enough lifeboats because nobody thought she could sink. Why the bigger the boat, the lesser the sink was a thing. I don't, I don't understand, <laughs> but you know, I think it breaking all these records kind of contributed to this callous arrogance on the part of its operators um, that led to a lot of precautionary steps not being taken. Hmm. So as we mentioned, of course, it was the subject of one of the most popular movies in American history, the Titanic, which came out in 1997. And at the time it was, it, it was the first film to surpass a worldwide box office gross of 1 billion. Now, as our, our listeners may learn, um, I am not the biggest movie person. I know a lot of Big moments in history have been covered by movies, and um, we'll probably be talking about a lot of people that have appeared in movies or had movies relevant to their stories. But I, I'm probably notoriously bad for not getting movie references, and even the ones I have seen, I just don't really remember them, I guess. So I know I've seen clips and scenes and stuff from the Titanic movie, but I really don't remember sitting down and watching it all the way through. Like, I don't have a big memory to go back on of this movie it's i mean it's a good movie it's a lot of people consider it to be one of the best movies and of course it's it's records kind of back that claim up without any spoilers it's essentially about uh, a, a couple of sorts uh, they don't start out that way but um, a gentleman named jack dawson who is played by leonardo dicaprio uh, wins a ticket to board the titanic and he's this you know, third class, much more poor, lower class guy. And he ends up meeting Kate Winslet's character, who's this upper class woman who's who's already engaged um, to another, you know, aristocrat of his day. And the two end up falling for one another. That's all I'll give away. It's, it's a great movie. I definitely recommend people see it. It's also extraordinarily authentic. Um, James Cameron, the director, was pretty aggressive when it came to making sure all the details in the film was right, even down to, you know, making sure that extras in the background were really getting into their character. He uh, allegedly, according to Billy Zane, uh, the gentleman who plays Cal, which is the aristocratic fiance of, of Kate Winslet's character, said in an interview that Cameron actually climbed onto the deck of the boat from the crane basket that was swinging him, swinging him around with the camera and, and cut the scene uh, only to go up to a, a background extra who was this old woman and, and grab her and was like, you're not just running. You're, you're, you're going to save your daughter who just went down to get her wedding ring. And you know, you, you regret letting that happen and letting her go. And it's just kind of remarkable. I, I mean, I don't know how much experience any of us have watching extras work. Um, but 
it's probably none at all because <laughs> no one pays attention to the extras in a movie yeah it was very important to him that you know even somebody who maybe was running in the background for a second or two was still really into the character and it i mean it of course showed in the movie's quality yeah i mean that's definitely attention to details and you see a lot of that in some of these bigger pictures that obviously very well known for all the awards it won and how well made how well made it was yeah and in fact it held that box office record uh, only until james cameron himself broke it with his later film avatar which is a more recent film and then another kind of fun fact so i mentioned the main character's name is jack dawson and uh, in, in fact in real life there was a j dawson on board the titanic in the the passenger log um, although james cameron didn't know about him or admitted to not knowing about him before the movie. So Jack Dawson isn't based on him. But even so, uh, this gentleman's grave, which is in Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia, is is very widely visited by movie fans. <laughs> Stupid people who don't know that it's not the character from this movie, or is it just... I mean, I think people would go even if they Because he's one of the name-recognizable victims of the Titanic. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's it's... It's a little bit of both, but I think there's probably people who know he's not the real, no, the movie wasn't based on him, but still want the picture with the the grave. Do we know anything about the real Jay Dawson? I mean, it'd be funny if he was like a complete nobody. <laughs> no. Now he has, <laughs> everyone knows where he's buried and goes to visit his grave <laughs> for no reason other than a movie that was made, what, 80 years after he died. <laughs> I mean, I I don't want to say anything for sure, but... I think it would be surprising if his grave was as as visited just because as it is because of that movie. So I'm sure he does. I can't say he does, but his his sight enjoys a lot more. Yeah, it was just an empty and, grave, not empty, yeah. but a grave that nobody visited except maybe a couple close family members for 80 years. And now there's always people there because a movie came out. Yeah. So now that we've given you guys a context of the ship and its background and history, the next thing we're going to do is get into Jack Phillips' life. Uh, But first, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, listeners. Um, So... This gentleman, Jack Phillips, uh, that we previously mentioned, was the senior wireless operator aboard the Titanic, along with his junior wireless operator, Harold Bride. And these were the only two men aboard the ship who, you know, were in charge of communications. Um, but to give you a bit of... We're about to learn how they uh, really screwed up, screwed the pooch here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I hate that phrase so much. Well, we'll, we'll see if... How... <laughs> Why is it a phrase? Who made that a phrase? Well, we came in here who talking about who, how who they're, just the dog? <laughs> they're the ones who could have saved the ship, but obviously something went very wrong. So excited to learn what went wrong here. Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. I mean, there's some decisions they make that, I don't know, we'll, we'll get into it and make some decisions about each person involved. Uh, but for some background on Phillips, he was born on the 11th of April in 1887 in Farncombe, Surrey, which was about halfway between London and Southampton, where the Titanic eventually left for its maiden voyage. He was the son of George Alfred Phillips and Anne Phillips, who had five other siblings along with Jack. Um, Only two of his siblings, unfortunately, survived to adulthood, both sisters, um, which is pretty standard for the day. I mean... (laughs) I feel like that's it's it's... like the third time in, what, episode number... Four episodes, it was like the third time we talked about how people die in infancy when they're little, or in the old days. <laughs> that's how, this whole podcast, that's, we're just like, yeah, kids die, it happens. all we it's know funny. about history is that history was only bad. half the kids survive to adulthood, <laughs> and that's really sad. But normal. <laughs> we're getting better. As we always point out. Medicine um, is getting better. <laughs> yeah, I hope. Uh, so, after he finished school in 1902... Uh, He began working for the Godalming Post Office, which is just outside of his hometown of Farncombe. And it's at this post office where he would begin to learn telegraphy, which is essentially the, I don't want to call it an art, but it's kind of an art, kind of a science of sending messages over this new technology called wireless telegraphs. 
After that, he began training to work with this technology for the Marconi Company in 1906. So a quick note on the Marconi Company, because they're kind of important to both Jack's life as well as, you know, the operation of ships in the North Atlantic at this time. This was founded by, I'm going to give this the best shot I can, Guglielmo Marconi. Nailed it. Yes. Guglielmo. Um, so How did I tell Guglielmo. <laughs> Guglielmo, it's like you have to try to not twist your tongue. I can't do it. I can't do that, period. So anyway, Mr. Marconi uh, was an Italian electrical engineer and inventor and considered a pioneer in the field of long-distance radio transmission. Um, So this is the first time in history where we could send messages without a wire. Before this, it was a landline that had to be buried. Um, So it didn't. It wasn't done like this, but for ships to communicate with each other, they would literally have to have a line just kind of dragging in the water to another ship, which obviously isn't practical. I mean, we still do that. There's still like transatlantic cables. That is how we. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. That run literally from coast to coast um, just to transmit messages. And we use it for even things like Netflix today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely not unheard of, but um, especially for small ships, um, which are both moving targets, communicating with one another. It it definitely was this this radio transmission was kind of groundbreaking technology. Guglielmo was also the uh, 1909 Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, a prize he shared with Carl Ferdinand Braun for their contributions to the wireless telegraphy uh, field. Um, and he's essentially the credited inventor of radio as a form of communication. Is there any controversy to that? Is that like we should research who invented radio transmissions and maybe have another episode on that person? Controversy as to whether or not he invented it? Yeah. I don't know. Let's find out. I like finding out inventor controversies. I have to keep listening to the podcast. Maybe we'll figure it out one day. So he he came up with this this thing called Marconi's Law, um, which as best as I can explain it is... A, a formula or a method of finding the di- the the maximum distance that you could transmit messages, um, and it, he's quoted as saying, uh, "For simple vertical sending and receiving antennas of equal height, the maximum working telegraphic distance varied as the square of the height of the antenna." It's basically pointing out the relationship between the height of the antenna and its ability to transmit a message certain distances. Math. So. Mr. Marconi created this company, the Marconi Company, which was the leading company in wireless telegraphy, Um, you know, kind of the apple of the wireless telegraphy world, if you will. By the time of the Titanic's maiden voyage, in fact, most of the ships operating in the North Atlantic were outfitted with both Marconi instruments as well as Marconi-trained wireless operators such as Jack Phillips. These messages could be transmitted up to 300 miles during the day, But that figure could actually, interestingly enough, double or triple at night due to something called long wave refraction in the ionosphere. Now, for people listening who may not be very familiar with long wave refraction in the ionosphere, could you maybe explain that to us in a uh, pretend we're five? Explain it to me like like I'm a five-year-old who owns a lemonade stand and... I can definitely do that. I mean, reading some of the the comments and, and articles by physicists about why this is so made me feel like I was five. And I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, um, but the two I promise I won't know if you get this wrong. <laughs> the two leading explanations that, uh, as best as I can retell them, are that one, there's a layer of the ionosphere that during the day is very good at absorbing radio waves. So it doesn't refract it, reflect it back at the the ground. But this dissipates at night because of the disappearance of the sun, leaving behind layers that are a little bit better at reflecting that wave back at the ground. The other reason is that the ionosphere itself rises at night, uh, essentially giving you a better angle to send messages further, kind of banking it off of that, that level as you would, you know, a pool table. I want to know how they figure that out. I have no idea. They're smarter than us. <laughs> That's why they did that and we're doing this. Bingo. So you said that these companies that operate these ships would have people like Phillips or 
other employees from places like the Marconi company that would work to, to do the communications on these ships. They would basically outsource mm -hmm. them from their normal ship crew to people that actually worked for the wireless company. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Uh, so they would not only install, Marconi would install the equipment, um, but would also provide you with an operator. Did Phillips go on other cross-Atlantic voyages before, or was this his first time really out on a big ship like this? I don't know that he had actually went across the Atlantic, but he, he worked on a number of other vessels. Uh, his training program was about five months long, and after that, uh, before getting assigned to the Titanic, he worked for the White Star Line's ship Teutonic, which is named for an ancient German tribe, the Teutons. Over the next six years after his first assignment there, he was assigned to the aforementioned RMS Lusitania and Mauritania, which, like I said, were record-holding vessels. In March of 1912, which was just before the maiden voyage of the Titanic, he was sent to Belfast, Ireland to to begin to be the senior wireless operator for the ship alongside. So he, so he wasn't a novice. He knew. No, he I mean, he doing. had worked yeah. for, he, he would work for six years at this point doing this. He was very good at what he did. And he was also joined by another experienced gentleman named Harold Bride. So there were two gentlemen aboard the ship that were responsible for kind of trading off and sending these messages. Obviously, one would usually be asleep while the other was working because they had to be available. One of them had to be available 24-7. What kind of messages would they be sending throughout the voyage? I mean, primarily more for an administrative purpose, messages to other ships about navigation or weather, ice warnings, ice warnings, wink, wink. The important stuff. And then also they sent passenger messages to shore, which was kind of a novelty at the time because of this new wireless technology. Passengers could actually send telegraphs to loved ones and friends on shore, which wasn't previously available to them. And that's kind of in the same vein as like sending a postcard from your vacation, I guess. I mean, it's really not, but you know, like the greetings from Sunny wherever that you might pick up at a gift shop and send yeah. home, but you can't send mail from cruise ship so they would send messages back to their loved ones at home and figure out what was going yeah. on or tell them how the ship was yeah essentially i mean that's exactly what this was i suppose used for imagine there were some saucy bits that they had to uh <laughs> interfere with and translate the messages of oh very interesting gosh. gossip i do wonder what the gossip was like what was considered saucy back then it's like 19 19 teens uh Telegram sexting. <laughs> the days of our lives aboard the Titanic. <laughs> I miss uh, you so much. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I miss your hands on my body. Stop. Please, stop. <laughs> Everyone has turned off this episode now. They don't even know what happened to the Titanic. At the, at Tuning this point. in next week, ASMR with Phil. <laughs> in telegraph form. <laughs> stop. So to move on, <laughs> Jack Phillips, interestingly enough, celebrated his, his 25th birthday the day after the Titanic voyage began. So despite being experienced, he was still a pretty young guy. He knows uh, what he's talking about with these telegrams. <laughs> so on the 10th of April, 1912, the Titanic departed on its maiden voyage, headed to New York City from Southampton, England. Two days later, on the evening of April 14th, Phillips was trying to clear a backlog. So the, the April 14th was going to be the, the final night of the ship's voyage. But due to a backlog of messages the day before, Jack was trying to clear all of these passenger messages that were supposed to be headed for Cape Race, Newfoundland. So he's kind of frantically working on, on these, these backlogs uh, on the evening of the wreck. So that night, shortly after 9.30 p.m., and this is where it starts to get a little confusing and interesting and and you start to wonder what actually went on and what motivations people had but shortly after 9 30 p.m phillips received an ice warning from the steamship maseba which reported a large ice field in the path of the titanic so this is another ship nearby reporting this large ice field uh, that which... seems like a much more important message than whatever personal messages he's dealing with yeah so despite acknowledging this warning phillips continues to work on the backlog of passenger messages um, and reportedly never delivered it to the bridge 
Like I said, there's some saucy bits that he's filtering through. He's (laughs) not paying attention to the ice warning. He's really invested in whatever personal messages (laughs) he's listening to right now. So getting, yeah, I mean, getting caught up on all the hot goss. This is the the first kind of odd thing that goes on. Like, why would you not deliver that to the bridge, or did he deliver it to the bridge? Of course, he. Spoiler alert: didn't end up surviving the the wreck to defend himself. But according to Second Officer Charles Lightoller, in his autobiography, Phillips explained that he quote put the message under a paperweight at his elbow just until he squared up what he was doing before sending it to the bridge. The second officer claims that the message never actually reached the bridge. So Lightoller is throwing him under the bus here. Maybe. It's possible. I mean, he survived. I mean, he is. Whether or not the story is true is, I guess, debatable. Uh, I mean, we have no reason to doubt Lightoller, I guess, if he's the one who's sharing this, but he's the one who says that Phillips didn't deliver the message. Yeah, well, I mean, there is, I suppose do with it what you will, but there's a little bit of evidence that, that might lead you to believe that he had more to cover up than he let on. Um, Because in that autobiography, he also mentions that had that message been given to the bridge and they disregarded it, they would have almost certainly been qualified to be charged with criminal negligence. So placing the blame on Phillips may have had a pretty enticing reason behind it uh, in that it would kind of relieve the the folks on the bridge the officers on the bridge from that responsibility interesting so even more interesting a second ice warning comes at 10 55 so a little bit over an hour later from a different ship the ss californian whose only wireless operator cyril evans reported that the ship was stopped and surrounded by ice what so, is the ss california is that a american ship no, uh, it is a British steamship, which was headed to Boston from Liverpool, so roughly the same path as the Titanic would be taking. It, however, had no passengers on board, and it it has this kind of controversial interaction or non-interaction, I guess, with the Titanic, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So this message comes from the wireless operator from Cyril Evans saying that the SS Californian is stopped and surrounded by ice. Seems like a pretty serious situation i don't know how intense this was for the day um, i wouldn't love to be on a cruise ship surrounded by ice but i'm also scarred with the memory of the titan well i don't have a memory of the titanic but i know what happened um <laughs> so this guy sends another ice message this is the second one that phillips has received but because both operators were using these spark gap transmitters and for those of you who don't know I don't know anybody who would know. I had to look it up. But these these transmitters were the kind of standard equipment. Like I said, the Marconi company installed their own equipment on these ships. Um, and these were the console, if you will, of these these communication devices. And essentially what they were was an electric circuit that ended in two little spherical nodes that were about an inch to two inches apart. And as the radio transmission came through uh, it essentially was transformed into an electric signal that was either on or off simpler sim- similar to binary code on a computer it's either a one or a zero so it's either on or it's off and there was this code developed called morse code um, that allowed the the operators to translate these buzzes which essentially sounded like bzz, 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 as that spark crossed the gap um into professional sound effects we have on this podcast you can find me in the next james cameron movie (laughs) that was not a soundboard that was just matt so yeah i mean it it is kind of crazy to me in researching this and in listening to some of these transmitters that these guys just sat there all day for hours just listening to dots and dashes as they were called uh, which were either short or long units of of electric sound and then translating them into English. Drive me crazy. So the problem with these is it wasn't like an AM, FM radio. You couldn't switch stations. You couldn't leave one signal and go to another. Um, You just had all of this noise. And if two people were sending you a message at the same time, they would both come through. Now, the further away somebody was, the quieter this would be. So... 
because the Californian was so close to the Titanic in comparison to Newfoundland, where he's trying to work on this backlog of personal messages, he, he kind of gets annoyed because he can't hear the operator in Newfoundland over Cyril Evans sending him this ice warning. So he kind of snaps at him and says, keep out, shut up, I'm working Cape Race. So Evans kind of throws up his hands. He listens for a while longer before turning in for the night. Again, putting the priority on those personal messages versus the important <laughs> ice warning. Yeah, and this is one of the most bizarre things I think that Jack Phillips does. I don't know if there's a particular reason. I I think I mean he's clearly a motivated individual. He he really is a hard worker, as we'll see. But I don't understand the motivation behind focusing on this outside of other than just a, a kind of callousness as to the dire situation they would eventually be in. Yeah, it does sound odd. I mean, his job is to report these messages. So, it, I mean, why would he be prioritizing on the personal messages unless he's just really focused on getting that one job done? But anyone who has this responsibility as this being their their job is to relay these communications. Why would you not heed the warning, like the danger warnings? His own life is at stake. And as we'll see, it, that's... He pays the price for not following these warnings. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that maybe, like I said, we are affected by the memory of the Titanic and what happened. And and maybe he just didn't see that as being possible. Like I said before, I think there was a certain arrogance about being on this grandiose record-breaking ship that kind of handicapped many of they the They thought nothing could go officers. wrong. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just find this, of all the things he did, this this one is the most kind of unexplainable and bizarre to me. But in any case, this this exchange with the Californian has a couple consequences. The first is, and, and most obviously, I suppose, is that, you know, we've discussed the Californian was trying to warn the Titanic of ice, a warning which, had it been heated, could have led to the Titanic avoiding the disaster entirely and moving ahead with its journey. Um, so this is, I mean, this is kind of at face value where they started to go wrong. But the other problem that occurred because Evans had received this message back from Phillips kind of saying, leave me alone, he went to bed um, and switched off the radio, which meant that they were unable to receive distress signals from the Titanic should it require assistance, which it Oops. shortly did. Um, and, and the Californian happened to be the closest ship to the Titanic. Um, now, sources have disputed this as a primary cause of the disaster. Others had, and people have indicated that there were other ships that sent ice warnings to the captain and the bridge of the Titanic. So people think they knew. And a lookout had been posted for ice. So it's kind of debatable whether or not this failure to pass on this message really had that much of an effect. They had already posted a lookout. I don't know how seriously they were taking it. Like I don't, I don't know the level of alarm that a posted lookout causes. So, yeah, I mean, you would think if I mean ice like this could take down a ship like the Titanic, and obviously you run the risk of running into it. You would have more than one safeguard against that being the reason yeah. your ship goes down. It's very possible that any one in charge of communication could miss one message you would think you'd have someone else keeping an eye out for it so to place all the blame on phillips already seems kind of shoddy at best for sure. as a reason yeah and i i certainly myself having research just don't believe it it all lies on him there's definitely some bizarre behavior but i don't think it all lies directly on his shoulders in fact this this other ship the ss californian despite the excuse that evans turned off their radio the crew actually ended up seeing the Titanic's rockets later on in the night at 12.47 a.m. So, okay, mm. their radio was off. Great. But they still saw these rockets coming from the Titanic. The crew woke up their captain, Stanley Lord, but he chose to ignore them and kind of just shrugged his shoulders and went back to bed. It's just like, <laughs> what a jerk. yeah, I mean, and, and he was... Uh, he was kind of nailed for the rest of his life for this. Uh, he didn't actually get any criminal charges, but both the U.S. Senate inquiry and the British Rec Commissioner's inquiry concluded that the SS Californian could have saved many, if not all, of the lives aboard the Titanic had immediate action been taken upon seeing those rockets. The rockets are distress signals, right? 
Yeah, they're essentially just a flare indicating. And there's probably no reason for them to shoot them off unless there's something seriously wrong with the ship. So for Captain Lord Stanley, sorry, Captain Stanley Lord, (laughs) thinking about hockey there, for Captain Stanley Lord to ignore them is almost in a way a death sentence for the people aboard the ship if he knows that he can do something to help them. Yeah, I mean, his his actions are pretty pretty reprehensible, um, which the U.S. Senate inquiry actually called them reprehensible. But, you know, like I said, no, no formal charges were ever brought against him. However, he did spend the rest of his life trying to clear his name pretty much to no avail. He's kind of known as the guy who didn't help out during the Titanic disaster. So the court of public opinion is much worse than uh, any le- law court of law. Yeah. The, the UK's Marine Accident Investigation Branch in 1992 came out with another report um, that still condemned his actions, but concluded to kind of clear his name, I guess, that due to limited time, the Californian simply would have only replaced the Carpathia's rescuing of survivors. And the Carpathia was the ship that actually did come to the rescue and save the remaining passengers aboard the lifeboats. So, I mean, I... I don't know enough about the marine accident investigation branch to, to know how thorough and and you know morally pure this investigation was or how much they could even possibly have known almost a, a century later but I, I think I mean Stanley Lord definitely holds a bit of the blame here for for not responding to that It's hard to believe that if they hadn't responded immediately that they wouldn't have been able to save at least more people than they did well, yeah, if you think, like, the Californian's the closest ship, which means it's closer than the Carpathia. It sees these rockets, which means clearly somebody aboard the ship is still above water. So I, I, I don't know. I don't buy that it couldn't have helped. Right. So, unfortunately, Captain Stanley Lord went back to bed. And so to, to backtrack a little bit back to the Titanic and itself at the wreck, around 11.40 p.m., So shortly after Jack Phillips receives this message from the Californian, the Titanic ended up meeting its fate. It struck this iceberg and it begins to sink. So this is the part where Jack Phillips kind of turns into a curious, over-focused wireless operator into a sort of hero. Junior operator Harold Bride had just woken up to relieve him of his duty uh, when Captain Edward Smith entered the room and told both the gentlemen to send out a distress signal. A while later, the captain would return telling them to send a call for assistance indicating the Titanic's position. So Phillips be- begins sending what at the time was the traditional distress signal CQD. And Bride jokingly reminds him to use this new code saying, quote, send SOS, the new signal. It might be your last just chance to send it, which he says in jest, but it's dark. <laughs> well, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't know. Um, so he makes this kind of ironic joke Uh, and so we all know cqd uh, as i said was the traditional distress signal it originated on the landline communication networks as cq which stood for secu or from the french from the french word securite so a a conventional nailed the italian earlier you could work on the french pronunciation i'm not french (laughs) securite secu so this was the conventional landline call for general alert, but it didn't really carry this emergency urgency. So the Marconi company, are you laughing at my, my rhyme? I'm laughing at emergency urgency. <laughs> emergency urgency. <laughs> That's terrible. It's my rap album coming out 2021. <laughs> Distress urgency. So it, it doesn't have this character indicating distress. Uh, so this the Marconi company added the D at the end, CQD, to stand for distress. So later on, beginning in 1906, which is around the time that Jack Phillips begins working aboard ships, uh, the German SOS was adopted as the International Morse Code Distress Signal. Why it took Jack Phillips so long to start using it, I don't know, but most people are more familiar with SOS. And the reason it was Old adopted... Die hard. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason it was adopted is because it's longer than most codes. It was nine characters instead of six. And it's also easier to hear. Um, So SOS, if you're not familiar with it, is three dashes, three dots, 
followed by three dashes. No, I'm sorry. Reverse that. It's three dots, three dashes, then three dots. So good thing you're not in charge of communication. I know, right? Oh, God. Sinking ship. Yeah, man. <laughs> so. As... OSO, what is that? <laughs> OSO. So. Oh, so bad. <laughs> we are sinking. <laughs> So it was longer and it was easier to hear. There weren't any gaps between letters and it was just a more uniform pattern to hear when, you know, people needed to understand this and not screw it up like I just did. So back to the ship, he's sending the new signal for his, for his last time. Shortly after 2 AM, the ship is starting to go down. Wireless power is almost gone. Captain Smith arrives again, thanks the men for their work and relieves them of their duties. And Harold Bride, who survived, uh, recalls being really moved by how Phillips continued to work, even while the, the cabin's flooding and they're losing power. Yeah, now he cares about the important messages. <laughs> yeah, of course. Now he's like, everybody come help. Interestingly enough, while the men were working, another crew member tried to break into their cabin and steal their life belts. <laughs> You know, being st- a lot of bad characters in this story. Yeah. I mean, so b- Bri- being strapping young men, Bride grabs the man and Philip stands up and knocks him out. They they then flee the cabin and leave the unconscious crew member behind to drown, Jeez. which isn't which isn't awesome. But like, hey, ship's going I mean, down. That guy started it, but like <laughs> they are leaving him to a watery. I lost my train of thought. So. This guy tries to steal a life jacket. They leave him for dead. They leave the cabin, split up. And this, some claim, is the last time Bride would ever see Phillips. Oh. Now, as I said, everyone's pretty sure he didn't survive. But there's some conflicting information as to how he died, when he died, what happened to his body. Many of today's researchers believe he actually made it to Lifeboat B with Harold Bride, which happened to be under the command of Second Officer Lightholder, which we've heard before. So in his in this autobiography, again, he mentions Phillips and says that he's kind of standing in the lifeboat listing all of the ships that had answered the call and should have been headed for them. And he says, as it turns out, the information from Phillips and the calculation were about right, though poor old Phillips did not live to benefit by it. He hung on till daylight came in, and we sighted one of the lifeboats in the distance. And then he, he's quoted as saying, I think it must have been the final and terrible anxiety that tipped the beam with Phillips, for he suddenly slipped down sitting in the water, and though we held his head up, he never recovered. I insisted on taking him into the lifeboat with us, hoping there still might be life, but it was too late. So he's saying that Phillips was a nervous wreck in the lifeboat and then fell in the water? I guess. I mean, he's basically saying that Phillips is standing there telling him who responded and where to look for them and, and calculating how long it should have taken them. And he then he basically indicates that Phillips just slumped down into the water. So, I mean, I think, I mean, it's t- after something like this, I could see it being possible for somebody to have like, I don't know, a stroke or a heart attack or something? Like a st- Yeah, it's a high stress a panic situation. Attack? I don't know. I'm sure Phillips feels some semblance of responsibility, but it just seems odd that he's coherent enough to be telling him the entire, you know, situation for all the surrounding rescue boats and when they'll be there and obviously Lightoller said that his calculations were about right, but he's also in not a good physical state and just collapses. Yeah, I mean, it's, and then, you know, an hour before that, he was, you know, going crazy on the telegraph. I mean, do we believe Lightoller? I don't know. I want to. I mean, I think it would be kind of a shame if they just threw him under the bus. Because like I said, they, they admitted to the fact that if they had known all the information that was sent to the Titanic and not acted, they would be liable for criminal negligence. Of course, they weren't charged with that or held liable. Um, so uh, while no researchers really indicated that to be the case, I, I don't know. It's it's definitely an odd... And it's hard to, like, there's not a lot of survivors and there's not a lot of credible witnesses from back then. It's not like people had video camera and photographs and all of this. Um, and many of the, even the, the written accounts that would have been kept during the journey would have been lost into the sea. 
So are there any other accounts of how he died or is that pretty well, widely accepted that there's, he just collapsed on the lifeboat? There's one other, uh, Archibald Gracie, which is another Titanic survivor who became a, essentially an amateur author and historian regarding the wreck, claims it was Bride, not Phillips, who was telling Lightoller of the different ships that had responded and were headed to the rescue. So that doesn't really tell us what happened to Phillips. It just indicates that he wasn't in the lifeboat and that so there may be holes in Lightoller's story. Maybe. Um, so we don't really know if he actually made it to the lifeboat. Lightoller says he did. Archibald Gracie says he didn't. I also, some part of me kind of questions. It's it's odd from today's, uh, I guess, sensibilities to em- embellish such a, a serious situation. But I also wonder how much of this was just Lightoller's storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, it just seems really dramatic. It must have been the final and terrible anxiety that tipped the beam with, like, I don't know. It it just seems like an odd way to write about. Yeah, he's obviously retelling a story for his book. And it's common in any kind of traumatic situation like this that people obviously misremember details. Yeah, so that too. It wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that he was in the boat with Bride, but was thinking Phillips because they obviously were close and had similar jobs and would be no knowledgeable of similar information regarding the other boats and stuff. But it is kind of odd, an odd way for him to have died if that's, you know, actually how he's recalling yeah. it correctly. Well, and even regarding the body, you know, Bride reports seeing Phillips' body boarded to the Carpathia from the lifeboat, but even this has been labeled an assumption by Bride and and believe that there was no clear evidence to the identity of the body outside of it having the clothing of a crew member. So do we know what happened to Bride post-Titanic? He obviously survived. You know what? I don't. I don't. He did survive. He, to my knowledge, didn't write any sort of biography. I will have to look that up and maybe we can include it on a, a post later down the road or I don't know, an addendum to this episode or maybe a whole new episode <laughs> about Harold Bride. But yeah, um, I don't know. It's There's a lot of questionable things. There's all this controversy and you know, the longer history goes on, the harder it's going to be to answer some of those questions. Is he widely, Phillips, is he widely viewed as the reason, not the reason that the ship sank, but the reason that it wasn't able to be rescued in time or that they didn't avoid the ice patch? I don't think he's widely viewed that way. I think he's just one part of the problem. You know, like there were just lots of bad decisions. But had he acted quicker, you know, put more emphasis on the initial warnings rather than focusing on the personal messages, the Titanic probably could have steered clear of the ice patch and completed its voyage. Again, it depends on who you ask. The U.S. Senate inquiry, yes. But this new report by the U.K., um, naval wreck i don't remember what it's called marine accident inquiry now says it's they the californian coming to the rescue simply would have just replaced the carpathia so Hmm. there's still still even conflicting reports on that so i don't think we'll really ever know i think it is clear like he did make some bizarre decisions and mistakes if you will that contributed in the same way that I think the arrogance of the ship and not having enough lifeboats and maybe not taking a disaster like an iceberg or an event like an iceberg seriously. But it's just easier to blame the dead guy. If you're Charles Lightoller, it is. (gasps) So nonetheless, uh, there's still memorials to Jack, both in Nightingale Cemetery in his hometown of Farncombe, as well as in the Phillips Memorial Grounds in Godalming, where he worked at that post office. He was, in fact, portrayed in the movie, um, in Cameron's movie, The Titanic, by actor Gregory Cook. Um, I don't know. I didn't watch the whole movie recently, but I don't know if he's actually in the the final cut. Uh, But there is a, a really neat deleted scene on YouTube that you can look up that portrays Phillips and Bride in the telegraph room. And in this scene, Bride kind of insists that Phillips leave with him. The cabin's starting to flood. And Phillips is just working away on the telegraph and he doesn't even look up. He says, I'm not going and continues to work. And and Bride kind of frustrated, puts a life jacket over him and hesitates for a moment before leaving. And it's just, I mean, it's kind of displays that history of him continuing to work as long as possible. Yeah, that little anecdote 
anecdote about him is notable enough that you know they put it in a scene <laughs> so he must have been well known for being a hard worker and trying to save the ship as best he could but still kind of odd that he would have just ignored those messages to begin with yeah definitely something a little weird going on <laughs> so you know you guys should write to us tell us what you think was charles lightholder a dirty scoundrel just passing off his blame onto phillips or did phillips really as phil put it screw the pooch <laughs> and and don't let captain stanley lord off the hook the guy who just completely ignored all the warnings or all the distress signals yeah that guy's definitely to blame on some level you can let us know what you think write to us at histories b-side at gmail.com or find us on any social media at histories b-side next up we've got the quiz we'll be right back we just want to take a minute and thank you for listening to histories b-side you know it takes a lot of time to research and put these episodes together so we wanted to let you know how you can support the show going forward go ahead and subscribe at anchor.fm forward slash histories b-side or wherever you're listening from if you'd like leave us a review and tell us what you think of our show if you're interested in advertising with the show and hearing your message in a spot like this send us an email to histories b-side at gmail.com we're looking forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening We like to end each episode with a short quiz uh, so that today's host can show off how much he really studied about today's topic and you, the listeners, can follow along and see how much you knew about it ahead of time and hopefully we learn some things along the way. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. So we're going to give you one specifically about the Titanic. Okay. One that's about the movie. All right. And one that's just kind of grab bag. (laughs) Oh, great. Grab bag. Grab bag naval questions. No, it's relevant to the Titanic, but... Okay. I don't know. We'll see if you've heard of it. So, specifically about the Titanic. What year was the wreck of the Titanic finally discovered? Oh. I want to say, like, 1975. Pretty close. 1985. Dang it. (laughs) <laughs> it was uh discovered on a u.s military mission but it still remains at its seabed oh okay i was thinking like I, I i was thinking it might be in the 80s i was trying to decide when they would have come out with the technology to have i don't know research submarines to go that that deep right all right so about the movie in the movie there is a famous diamond Do you know the name of the diamond and any real life connections to it? The diamond is called the heart of the ocean jewel. I think that might be okay. See, I, I heard Jim Carrey saying it in Bruce almighty, (laughs) which is why I wasn't sure if that was actually what it was called or him just being a goofball. So the diamond in the movie is called the heart of the ocean. It's based on a real life diamond called the hope diamond. Hmm which is a magnificent blue diamond. It weighs about 45 and a half carats and is currently stored or housed at the Smithsonian Institute. Do you know how big it is? I feel like 45 and a half carats. Oh, okay. You just said that. Sorry. Yep. For for those of us that aren't jewel experts. (laughs) It's pretty freaking big. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, you know, inches, I guess, but that's a pretty good sized diamond. Oh, I actually do have it here. It is about 33 millimeters by hmm. 27 and a half millimeters and 13 millimeters thick. Dang. So no no small feet, no small diamond. I'm pretty sure I've seen this Hope Diamond before. The last time I was in D.C., we went to a Smithsonian Museum and they had this gemology display, this whole section gemology. on it. I don't know if that's even a word or if it's the right word to describe this, but yeah, I remember they had all these famous and rare gemstones and in the center of it in this big case was this huge blue diamond that I would have to think was this one. Interesting. You know, my memory is not that good of it, but um, it was definitely how many giant blue diamonds are there. Yeah, I remember there being some kind of display about the reference to the Titanic movie. Interesting. I should check that out. 
Now your final question, I'm not sure if you will be familiar with this or not, but there was a book that was published in 1898 written by Morgan Robertson. Uh, it features a fictional British ocean liner that sinks in the North Atlantic after striking an iceberg. What is the name of this book? Oh, crap. Is the ship named the Titan? The ship is named the Titan. That's what I thought. I don't know the name of the book, but I have heard this. Well, the original name of the book was called Futility, but they actually rebranded or reissued the book, calling it The Wreck of the Titan, uh, shortly after the actual RMS Titanic sunk. So <laughs> it, it's crazy, and I don't have all the details in front of me, but the similarities between the Titan ship and the book Futility are crazily similar to the actual Titanic. And it's just, what are the odds that this yeah. <laughs> book predicted you know, a wreck in the North Atlantic by hitting a patch of ice. That's Simpsons level predictions. I bet that guy sold a ton of books. I mean, not that, that maybe not initially a positive but thing, but <laughs> once, the, once someone made the connection, that book couldn't stay on the shelves. Yeah. Interesting. Lucky for him. Not so lucky for everyone on the Titanic. Uh, I have a <laughs> sinking feeling about this. Ew. <laughs> I had an added a nautical pun. All right, that's enough of this episode. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next time. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can support the show by visiting anchor.fm slash histories b-side. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side. <laughs>